All right. Well, it is uh, 5.30. I'm getting the class started. This is where we stopped last time. Um, so I hope you guys you know, were keeping up with the reading of the modules. Um, so what we're going to do today is kind of overlap a little bit with what we talked about last time. And then most likely than not, we are going to proceed to talk about comparison, which is a really, really important topic. But we're going to go back a little bit and just talk a little bit about you know, what is two's complement and why it is useful. Okay, so because you're going to need that for today's lab. <clears throat> That's one of the reasons why this is going to be important. All right. Um, I hope you guys still remember this wheel, right? So this wheel you know, basically talks about in uh, when n equals to 16, and we are talking about congruent modulo 16, um, whether a value is congruent modulo 16 with something else has to do with, if I were to represent that value, how, you know, where is the position of the needle? Now, it is regardless of how many times I have to rotate that needle. In other words, if I have to rotate it you know, 16 times, okay, you know, or 36 times, or however many times, but if it lands on the same slot on this circle, it is still considered to be congruent modulo 16 with all of the other values that end up at exactly the same spot on this particular circle. Is that okay? All right. <clears throat> so the important part about this is how we, go, how we are going to look at the circle in signed interpretation. So this is not in the notes, so you might want to, you might find this useful, okay? Because one, it is a very pictorial way of representing the same thing, and two, it's a different way of looking at things. It's two, four, six, eight, ten, and fourteen, and then finally we got a one, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, 13 and 15. Okay. Yep. Yes, I am recording that. Just double check. Yep, we are definitely recording. All right. So in this case, you know, we have 16 slots, which means you know every slot is going to have a distinct 4-bit pattern. So I'm going to write the 4-bit patterns here as well. So 0, 0, 0 is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, whoop, okay. That was a little bit too fast there because that's supposed to be 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1011, 1, 1, 1, 0, oops, okay, 1100, 1110, 1110, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, Following up with the discussion from last time, meaning that if I have a if I have a needle like this, uh, rotating the needle clockwise is increasing, rotating the needle up counterclockwise is decreasing. Where do you think negative one is going to be? <coughs> the same as fifteen, which is the one 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 pattern. Okay, you're correct. So I'm going to write the negative values inside the circle, just so that they stand out here like that. And then the next one, the next uh, negative value is going to be here, there, okay, just like that. And there we go. So now we have you know, certain patterns that have two possible values that they, the bit pattern may be representing. I'll give you an example. Let's look at the bit pattern of 1, 0, 1, 1. You can see how, you know, on the outside of the circle, it can be used to represent 11, but it can also be used to represent negative 5. Does that make sense to you? Because 11 minus negative 5 is exactly 16, which means if I am already here at, 
11, and I say I want to get to negative 5, I have to rotate this needle counterclockwise 16 slots, which ends up at exactly the same place. So that is why negative 5 and 11 are congruent modulo 16. Okay, what about the other ones? You know, how come we don't put a negative 9 at the bit pattern of 0, 1, 1, 1? Because we want to have the same number uh, of non-negative values as there are negative values. So this is the best way to divide up and say, okay, we have out of 16 possible values, eight are negative and the other eight are non-negative. So that is why we stop at negative eight, which is also represented by the bit pattern of one, zero, zero, zero. Yep. Because we want you know, half the values to be negative and the other half non-negative. <clears throat> and zero is non negative. Uh, because there are only 16 slots, you cannot have that. Because it's a choice of how we interpret a bit pattern. So, given a particular bit pattern, we can only choose to interpret it one way or another. You cannot look at it as one way and then you look at it. That's another way, because what the value it is representing has to be just one, has to be one of the two possible values. Yep. So, nope, it depends on whether it is signed or unsigned. It depends on whether it is signed or unsigned. The same bit pattern can be, it can, they can correspond to the same bit pattern, so you, you have to choose how you want to interpret that bit pattern. Yep. Not necessarily. If you want to represent up to 15, but there's no necessity to represent negative values, then you can just say, I'm going to look at these four bits in an unsigned fashion. Then you only get the values from 0 to 15, but you cannot at the same time interpret the bit patterns as negative values. Okay, so that's a very good question, which leads to another question, which is, if I just you know, encounter the bit pattern of 1100 somewhere in the memory of a computer, what is it? Is it representing 12, or is it represent, representing negative 4? So my answer is going to be a little bit rude, but the proper answer is, why do you care? Literally, why do you care? You see the bit pattern of 1100 floating somewhere within the memory of your computer. Why do you ask the question? Is it negative 4 or is it 12? Because it, 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 it can be neither. Yes, go ahead. But, you're, but in that case, you know what that location is supposed to be representing. Then you have to choose one way to rep, to, of what it is representing. But if you just look at the bit pattern of 1100, not knowing the context, it may not be representing a value. It, it may not be representing an integer because it may be just you know, some corresponding to the pixels on the screen. So if you have one of those uh, e-paper you know, screens, this can be, you know, we have a white pixel, a white pixel, a black pixel, and a black pixel. That's all it is, which means there's no intrinsic interpretation of the bit pattern. The bit pattern is only useful, or the interpretation of the bit pattern is only useful when you are planning to do something with it. Only when you know what you're planning to do with it. Yes. Let me show you an example, okay? So the answer is correct, yes, okay? So I'm gonna show you some examples here, okay? Because you know, this is gonna be a review of your know, binary addition. It is going to be a review of you know, uh, patterns you know, that we are seeing here. So it's actually serving multiple purposes. I'm glad you asked that question. All right. <clears throat> so let's consider, you know, without understanding what, whether it's signed or unsigned, we are just going to carry out a particular calculation. In this case, I am just going to add 0, 0, 1, 1, and, uh, well, I'm just going to pick 
Okay. I have to turn off the screen saver. Give me a second. <clears throat> because otherwise it's going to come back and bother us again and again. All right. So okay, here. Okay. This one is. Okay. That's why. Okay. There we go. All right. So that should be disabled now. Okay, so getting back to 0011, and we are adding to 1001, and we want to find out you know, what the result is. Okay, so we have x, y, q, because this is addition, we have k for carry, and then we have s for sum. And I'm going to do this using logic gates, okay, because I want you guys to practice your thinking in logic gates. So one exclusive or with one is a zero. One exclusive or with a zero is a one. Zero exclusive or with zero is a zero. Zero exclusive or with a one is also a one. Are we doing okay so far with that? Okay. And because the column zero is the least significant column, so the carry bit you know, for K zero is going to be a zero. But now you know, for K one, it's going to be a one because uh, this one and this one is a one, and that already determines that you know, K1 has to be a one. <clears throat> when we're trying to determine K2, we have one and zero being a zero. Okay, it's not contributing a one, but this one and this one is indeed a one and contributing a one over here. Then we have zero and zero being a zero, zero and one being also a zero, zero or zero is a zero, so we put that zero here. Zero or one is a zero. One or zero, excuse me, one, zero and one is a zero. One and zero is also a zero. Zero or zero is also a zero. Yep. Huh? Using their very original definition, except the C is using conjunction instead of the comparison. Because you know, k of i plus 1 is c of, come on, you guys should know this by now, x i y i or c of q i k i. That's right. Okay. And then for base 2 only, what, is, what does c look like? If I have c of u v, how, is, how does that look like? U and V, that's right, okay? And which is written as if it is a multiplication, but this is a conjunction instead, okay? So that's the notation that we have been using. What looks like multiplication is actually conjunction in the context of Boolean operations. All right, so we, we got one more row to finish, here, which is the S row. Um, this is something that we just did on Tuesday, okay? How do we compute S of I? Yep, okay, very good. Okay, and what does the R function look like for binary um, operations? Yep, that's right. Okay, very good. <clears throat> I think two people of the entire class use a conjunction gate instead of an exclusive OR gate in that particular lab. And I took off, hmm, I would say, some points, you know, because. Um, First of all, we should know by now it is exclusive OR. Two, running the test driver would have found the problem. So for those particular reasons, you know, I think you know, giving 50% of partial credit to the, those submission is generous. There was one person who combined all the K bits and sent it out all to the sum you know, output. And even that person got, I think, 1.25 out of 5 points, which I also think is awfully generous. Okay, because given the test driver, no one should turn in something that does not work. All right, so I'm just letting you guys know my expectation because you know, there's a reason why I give you the test driver is so that when you're done with the circuit, you can test it and you can find out whether it has the identical output compared to you know what it is supposed to be all right <clears throat>
So now that we know what the S uh, bit look like, so ex zero exclusive or with zero is a zero, one exclusive or with one is a zero, zero exclusive or with one is a one, one exclusive or with a one is also a one. Have I once talked about what these bit patterns are representing in terms of their values? Nope, I did not, right? Okay, so now we can choose and say, okay, so let's see whether this works when those particular values are unsigned, okay? So we consider unsigned first. So if they are unsigned, 0, 0, 1, 1 would be representing what? Three, okay? And then one, zero, zero, one would be representing nine, okay? And then one, one, zero, zero is representing Nice, okay, that seems to work out, right? Three plus nine is 12, okay, we're good here. So now the next question is, what if I look at these bit patterns in a signed, using the signed interpretation? So I know most of us you know, do not remember the signed interpretation, so I am going back to this circle here, and I ask, what is 0011? Ah, 0011 is always three. Okay, signed or unsigned, 0011 is always three. Okay, okay, we got that. What about 1001? What is that representing? Negative seven, okay, very good. So we are adding, what, three to negative seven? And what is the result of 1100? What is that supposed to be representing? Signed interpretation. Negative four, is that right? So if I add <clears throat> three to negative seven, I should get negative four, and negative four also has a representation of one, one, zero, zero. So this is why I said earlier, it doesn't really matter whether they're supposed to be signed or unsigned, you use exactly the same mechanism of adding and also subtracting. In other words, add and subtract by themselves do not care whether the bit patterns are representing signed versus unsigned values. They work, they just work, yep. Mm, sort of, okay, because the way I, how I used half the wheel is based on uh, congruent modular math. So that is why it works, it's because of congruent modulo math. Because you, know, you can see how negative 4 and 12 are congruent modulo 16. They are the same. Um, what about 1001? 9 and negative 7 are also congruent modulo 16. 3 is all by itself, so you know, we don't have to worry too much about 3 because it has one single identity to begin with. Negative nine and seven are not congruent modulo 16. That is correct. You, what you said is correct. They are not congruent modulo 16, but nine and negative seven are. The way you find that out is you do a subtraction and see if the difference is a multiple of 16. Nine and negative seven, if you do a subtraction, nine minus negative seven is 16, and 16 is a multiple of 16 itself, so that's why they are congruent modulo 16. Nine minus seven is a two. Two is not a zero, and as a result, nine and seven are not congruent modulo 16. Yeah, well, yes, because the other half, you know, okay, we only have one half of the values that are assigned you know, with negative because we want the same number of negative numbers as there are non-negative numbers. But in the negative numbers, we are basically looking at whatever value is there and say, okay, uh, let's subtract 16 from nine and we get seven, negative seven. If we subtract 16 from 10, we get negative six. So when, by the subtraction of a multiple of 16, we get the negative value, but that negative value is congruent modulo 16 with the original positive value. Are we doing okay so far? All right. So congruent modulo, you know, uh, math is is weird in a way, but it is 
also not too weird in a way. Um, instead of thinking about, you know, I'm walking on the street, okay, where one side is positive, one side is negative, and either side stretches out to infinity, you're now walking in a hamster wheel, <laughs> where each step is numbered, but if you walk enough steps, you end up at the same step again. Is that okay? You can walk backwards, and eventually you, can, you, you end up at the same step again as well. Are we good so far? All right. So reestablishing this part allows us to go back to the math part a little bit. And I'm just going to repeat that portion because it is, we might, I might have rushed that part a little bit you know, from last time. OK, so I'm going to you know, talk about which part we are talking about. OK, so this time I'm going to use just, use, I'm just going to use the mouse pointer to talk about this. And I think I need to roll back one slide to look at, OK, we'll start with this one here, OK? Negative v is, mod, is congruent modulo n with negative v, uh, the negation of v plus k times n. OK, are we OK with that observation? And why is that the case? Because it is by definition. What definition are we talking about? Okay, so if we are thinking about what definition we are talking about, I am a little concerned because the definition is something that we talked about at the beginning of the previous class. Okay, what does it mean when I say A and B are congruent modulo N? It means that, okay, A can be expressed as some kind of value, and we have the same v over here, plus a coefficient times n, and b can be expressed as the same v plus possibly a different coefficient times n. So using that definition of congruent modulo n, <clears throat> if we go back to over here, so using that particular definition of congruent modulo n, this statement has to be true. Does that make sense? Are we good? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so in this case, you know, I basically say, what if k is just 1, okay? Sure, I mean, k can be any integer. It can be positive, can be negative, can be 0 itself. So 1 is perfectly okay. So what if k is 1? So if k is 1, then we say neg the negation of v is congruent modulo n with the negation of v plus n. Is that okay? This is really just a special case of this particular statement here where k equals to 1. Are we good? All right. <clears throat> and then using algebra, I turn something that's easy, which is just n all by itself, into something that looks unnecessarily complicated. So n becomes n minus 1, that whole thing plus 1. Is that okay? Okay. And then I turned it into something even more complicated by rearranging things a little bit. And I just say, okay, let's move that n minus 1 all the way to out here, move the negation of v into this math operation so it becomes minus v. And then the plus 1, guess what? It's outside the whole thing. You know, I'm just leaving that thing by itself. <clears throat> so in algebra, what rule or what law allows me to move things around like that? There are two, there are two laws, by the way. Associative law is one, and then the other one is commutative. Very good. OK. Excellent. So the bottom line is now I can, revert, I can rewrite the negation of v to be uh, congruent modulo n with n minus 1, the whole thing, minus v plus 1. Are we good with that math? Okay, so this is, it looks really kind of awful, looks kind of ugly, but there's a reason why it looks this ugly. <clears throat> so it is significant because, you know, in our cases, because we are only talking about a, an integer that, is, that has w bits, so that means, you know, our n is always a power of 2. When w is 4, n is 16. When uh, w is 16, n is 65,536. 
okay, and so on. Because your basically n is just your two to the power of w, where w is the width of our integers. Are we doing okay so far with that? Basically, I'm just saying that you know, we are not talking about just any n. n has to be a power of two. All right. <clears throat> So when that is the case, you know, I'm just going like, okay, fine, you know, so we write, we write everything as the negation of V is congruent modulo with two to the power of W, because that's basically N. And then, you know, everywhere N is, you know, I turn it into two to the power of W. Okay, so why is that significant? So to understand the significance of this is, okay, let's use an example. So the example is, okay, let's consider W to be four, which means you know, our n is 16. So all those wheels that we have been drawing all along, they're gonna be applicable here. <clears throat> and we're gonna consider v to be three. So we want to see what negative three or the negation of three is going to look like, okay? So that's the whole point of this operation is, how is the negation of three represented? That's the whole point of this entire discussion. Okay, so using this original thing, we now say negative three or the negation of three, arithmetic negation of three is congruent modulo with 16 because you know, W is four with, okay, you know, two to the power of W is 16, 16 minus one is 15. And then we have a subtraction of three and then you know, we have to add one eventually to the entire thing. So the focus is, eh, let's forget about the plus one at this point. We are focusing on what is 15 minus three, okay? Or the power of two, some power of two minus one, and then subtract another bit pattern from it. So last time we looked at this already, um, the whole math is at the corner of this entire thing right here. 15 is one, 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 one in base two. Three is zero, zero, one, one in base two. So after doing all the calculations, we end up with one, one, zero, zero as the end result. But we notice one thing in particular, okay? Because <clears throat> one thing we notice is X is always just once. Every single bit position of X is a one. Whenever you have two to the power of something minus one, then the binary representation of that value would be all ones. The only question is how many ones. So in this case, since W is four, we have four ones. Does everybody understand what I mean, what I just said? Yes. Yep. But it, but it is, the important part is what it looks like in base two. It is, um, so what you said is the value, you know, the, the largest value that we can represent uh, with W bits is going to be two to the power of W, the whole thing minus one, you're correct. But this time we are, we are more interested in what it looks like in base two. It's gonna be all ones, okay? It's gonna be all ones. So when it is all ones, then we have another observation. So if X is always a one, you have something about y, and you're doing a subtraction. What do you think you know, um, d is going to look like? We don't even need q or t to figure this out. The question is, what do you think d is going to look like? How is d related to y? Go ahead. It's the logical knot of y. d is the logical knot of y. Why? Okay. Put a zero here, one minus zero is a one. So D is the logical knot of Y in that case. Well, the only other value Y can be is a one. Then you have one minus one, which is a zero. Zero is also the bitwise knot of one or the logical knot of one. So that's why in this case, <clears throat> the subtraction that we saw earlier can now be implemented as a, um, as a negation. So you know, this, there's a whole discussion here, but it's all summarized on the next slide. And it basically just said that you know, um, our D 
or bit i of d is the negation of bit i of y when x are all ones. That's kind of the conclusion, okay? So that gives us the ability to do something like this, okay? I'm just pointing it out. <clears throat> that gives us the ability to say two to the power of w minus one, the whole thing minus v, is nothing more than just the tilde of v. Tilde as an operator in C or C++ is bitwise not, which is, you can, you can think of it as a multi-bit not gate. Every bit that is coming in is negated, so the corresponding output bit is just the negation of whatever bit is at that po same position. Is that understood? Or does anyone want me to use LogiSim to illustrate that concept? Yes? That would be great. Okay. So the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's do that. And I'm just picking out a terminal here. Logisim. Logisim is great because it's a tool you know, that you can actually do something with and do the observation. So in this case, you know, we just simply need a multi-bit NOT gate. So if we go under gates, we pick out NOT gate here. We want a multi-bit input pin. Okay. And I know this is not multi-bit. That's okay. We'll fix everything all at once. Because I got a really cool thing of selecting everything that has a bit width and change all the bit width at the same time. Let's change all of them to four. Aha. All right. So now you can individually change the bits. Okay. You can say, I want you know, bit zero of the input to be a one. And you can see how bit zero of the output becomes a zero. Or you can say, I'm going to change your know, bit three of the input to a one. And you can now see how bit three of the output is now changed to a zero. This is what I mean by a bitwise not. Okay. Which is represented by the tilde operator in C or C or you know, any language that's based on C. So is that okay? Does everybody understand you know, what this whole thing is trying to illustrate? Yep. Well, it's bitwise not. Do we know how to make a not gate out of transistors? Because how do you make a NOT gate? Okay, this is going all the way back to week one. Do you guys still remember? <laughs> NAND. Okay, what, what, how, what do we do with NAND to make a NOT? No, X NAND X is correct, okay? If you want to negate X, you basically perform X NAND X. You use the same value as both inputs of the NAND gate then the output becomes the negation of that value. And what is so special about the NAND gate? Hmm? It can make everything, but what makes a NAND gate? For transistors, very good. And transistors are actual physical devices, and you can actually go buy you know, two P-type transistors, P-N-type transistors, you know, wire up the whole thing and turn it into a NAND gate. It is physical. You can actually do it. How many people have taken an ET class, uh, electronic technology class? Okay, um, so you know you can go to the stock room and just say, I want to check out, you know, two P transistors and two N transistors. Hook it up the way that we talked about it, and test it. Okay, you know, just use hook up the output to an LED. Okay, and then you can test the input. It's like, okay, I want the this input to be high, that input to be low, and then the output is going to be the negation or the NAND between those two values. You can actually do that, okay? So in a certain sense, this class can be very hands-on if you want it to be, you, but, but you have to make all the connections in order to make it you know, hands-on and concrete. All right, so are we good with the bitwise not? Yes. Okay. So a NAND, so we can use NAND gates to make a NOT gate, right? 
So that means, yes, if you want to use NAND gates, we can use a NAND gate to do just that. Okay, so I'm going to do this once, okay, but, you know, this is something that you probably should know at this point, okay, except, you know, we have not really done it this way. Actually, we do. We have already done um, a lab like this. Okay, how, do you guys still remember that lab? Okay, I believe it was the second lab, so people who added to the class later may not have gone through that lab because it's not required, but if you started from the beginning here, you should have done that lab already. Okay, so we're going to pick out an NAND gate here, uh, turn the input into uh, two only, okay, two like that, and we have four data bits, you know, in order for this to work, and we'll make it a little bit smaller just to, so that it looks nicer, and what I said was, you know, you need uh, the same input to go to both ends of this, okay, so this is not going to look very nice, but it will suffice. So, the input goes to one input, the input pin goes to one input, goes to the other input, and the output pin goes straight to here, and voila. Now we have the negation gate again. So because you know, this is, if the input pin is known as X, then we have X NAND X being just negation itself. All right. So sometimes it's good to have these little refreshers, I would say. There we go. Okay. So are we sufficiently convinced that we, are, we know what this is representing now? It is a bitwise knot of the bit pattern representing B itself. Okay? And the plus one is still here. We still have to plus, we still have to add that one. So I'm claiming that whatever bit representation, whatever binary represent representation is coming out of here is representing the arithmetic negation of B. That is my claim. Sounds kind of magical, right? You know, because I just turned an arithmetic operation, which is arithmetic negation, into you know, something that I can do using just bit operations. The bitwise knot is definitely a bit operation, but we also know how to add one using logical operations, okay? So now the question is, I don't believe you, okay? I want you to show me, okay? Just show me how this is going to work. So let's go ahead and take a look at some examples. Um, <clears throat> and where did I put my pen? Right here. <coughs> so we want to consider, let's say, the negation, okay? Arithmetic negation of five, okay? So we ask you, what is the bitwise representation? What is the binary representation of the arithmetic negation of five, okay? So we go like, okay, this is the arithmetic negation of, okay, let's just consider four bits. How do we represent five using only four bits? Zero, one, zero, one is correct, okay? Zero, one, zero, one, and I'm gonna put a two here. You know, just to emphasize this is a base two number. And now I go like, okay, but Tech mentioned that the, arithmet the arithmetic negation of something is the same thing as the 2D or the bitwise knot of the same thing plus one. Is that okay? Are you associating the, the, the last derivation to what I just talked about in the notes? Are we good? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so now we carry out this operation. What is the bitwise knot of 0, 1, 0, 1 in base 2? 1, 0, and 0. Very good. Okay, in base 2, and then we are just adding 1 to it. And what would, the, what would be the result of 1, 0, 1, 0 plus 1? 1, 0, 1, 1. Oh, okay. This is kind of strange, right? Because I am now claiming that 1, 0, 1, 1 as a bit pattern using only four bits is, use, is representing the arithmetic negation of five, which is otherwise known as negative five. Okay, so what, what are you gonna do? If, if you are me, if you're lecturing, okay, right now, what are you gonna do next? Go back to the circle, because we labeled all those things in the circle and then we look up what? What was it again? One, 
one zero one one, right? So one zero one one is indeed negative five. Okay, so are we are we getting a good understanding of how that operation works? Okay, all right. All right, so there are names, okay? This entire thing is called two's complement of whatever pattern we are dealing with. So in this case, this is the two's complement of 0, 1, 0, 1 in base two. This thing here is also known as the one's complement of 0, 1, 0, 1 in base two. So C2 is two's complement, C1 is one's complement. It's, it's an AKA kind of thing. <laughs> so bitwise not is also known as one's complement. And then one's complement plus one is also known as two's complement. <clears throat> that's just how the terms goes. I mean, that's how they're defined. Yep. Ah, okay. So I, I think I understand your question. So your question is, what, we, what if we start with a bit pattern that is one zero, one zero, okay? And what is it representing? Is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah. It is because it is specific to this example. I'm specifically referring to this portion is the same thing as, you know, it can be rewritten as, you know, C1 of, Zero one zero one in base in base two, and this entire expression all the way can be rewritten as C two of zero one zero one in base two. All right, are we good so far? Okay, one more thing that I need you guys to notice, okay? Because your programming, computer science, computer engineering, and a lot of STEM stuff is about pattern recognition, okay? So can you guys tell me something that is common to all the negative values? What do they all have in common? Okay, go ahead. The leftmost digit is a one. Yep, okay, I heard somebody said your sign, okay, sign bit. Yes, it is called a sign bit because if the most significant bit is a one, <clears throat> and you are term, you're deciding to interpret the value in a signed, you know, met, uh, signed way, then you're looking at a negative value, okay? So this is, this is a very good observation, okay? Excellent. Yep, go ahead. Um, are you referring to this 15 over here? Yeah. Well, 15 and negative one have the same representation, not one. One has its own representation, which is zero, 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 one. But negative one is represented by one, 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 one. I'm not sure whether I addressed the question or not. It, you cannot. You simply you're you're basically out of range. You're out of range in that case. So let's talk about the range of values that you can represent. And let me see if that is already in the notes. <clears throat> Might be in the notes already. Mm, nope. I may not have put it here. Okay. Okay, so we can actually talk about it now because I can go back to the circle. Okay, so let's go back to the circle. Remember why I chose only eight of these to be negative values? Because I want to have the same number of negative numbers as that there are positive values or non-negative values, right? So in this case, what is the range of values that I, that I can represent when I choose to say, I want to look at everything as signed? 
What is the range of value? What is the most negative value I can represent here? Negative eight. And what is the most positive? The seven, very good. What about unsigned? Which means I don't need to represent anything that's negative. I can use everything on the non-negative side. What is the smallest value of an unsigned interpretation? Zero to 15. Okay, very good. Okay, so remember this. <clears throat> So the next thing I want to ask is with W bits, okay, uh, with W bits, okay, what is the range in signed interpretation? So this is also an important thing that you need to do when you are in computer science. You know, if you're programming or if you're trying to understand you know, the math of computer science, you need to be able to generalize. In other words, we know that you know, this portion uh, is for when W is four, right? You know, because we have four bits. So I'm asking, in general, if I just tell you that we have W bits, how do I determine the lowest or the smallest value, the most negative value in signed interpretation? Mm -hmm. It'll be negative two to the power of W minus one, and what is the most positive value? The whole thing minus one. Yep, because otherwise you get negative eight to eight, but it is actually negative eight to seven. What about sign, unsigned, sorry. What about unsigned? Okay, this part is easy. <laughs> and it goes to where? Two to the power of W, then the whole thing minus one. Yep, there you go. <clears throat> now, why do you think this is important? Even if you don't program ever in, in you know, assembly language, why do you think this is important? Let's just say that you only program in C or C++ or Java for all, you know, all, all that I care. Why do you think this is important? Yes. Yep. The, the problem with the C and C++ languages is when you use, when you use the, the, the type int, it doesn't tell you how many bytes or how many bits is, are being used to represent an integer. So if you're writing um, <clears throat> a program on a 16-bit or 8-bit platform, like an Arduino, an int is only 16-bit wide. If you're doing that on a 32-bit platform, it is a 32-bit you know, integer. But if you're doing it on a regular PC with the AMD 64 architecture, then integers are by default 64-bit wide. So it kind of depends on you know, what is your architecture. So there are ways to kind of get around these problems. We'll talk about those you know, later. So I recommend everybody to understand you know, what is the width of an integer when you declare a type as int, because you, know, you, you have to understand what is the range of values that can be represented when you just say int, or when you just say unsigned, what is the last, what is the largest value that you can represent? It is important. I can tell you a story about why, what happens when you don't observe you know, those, when you, when you don't pay attention to those things. <clears throat> Years ago, I taught a robotics class at UC Davis, and uh, in the motion control software, we have to, we have to do, do some squares and do some you know, kind of funky math. <clears throat> I was testing the algorithm on the PC. You know, I was controlling the stepping of a stepper motor just fine, okay? Not a problem. But when I ported that code onto the controller that, actually, that is actually on the, on the robot, it works up to a certain point, but when the displacement exceeds a certain range, it stops working. What I did was I hit exactly that limit. Because on the PC, an int at that time was 32-bit wide, but on the controller, it was only 16-bit wide. The calculation basically you know, exceeded the range of value that a 16-bit number can represent. So those bugs can be very, very annoying because you can see that the program works perfectly when it's in simulation on the PC, but when it's on the robot, it works up to a certain point. <laughs> <laughs> and then past that certain point, 
it stops working. It's like, why? It should be working in both cases, and if it's not working, it should always be not working in the other case. How come it's working in some cases and not working in some other cases? So the width of integers is very important, even outside of the context of assembly language programming. All right, so I think we are pretty much done with this particular module you know, of talking about signed versus unsigned. Yes, go ahead. <clears throat> well, I just had to declare the integers to be wide enough you know, to accommodate the range of value that I'm dealing with. Um, so the correct solution, okay, so since we're on this topic, might as well give you guys the, the correct solution. So let me switch to the right um, browser. There we go. So the correct solution is to use um, integer types that clearly indicate the width. So what you need to do is to pound include standard integer dot h. So standard integer dot h, you know, s t d i n t dot h, allows you to use um, type definitions that clearly indicates the width, such as int three two underscore t is a thirty two bit signed integer, u int sixty four underscore t is an unsigned 64-bit integer. So that works across all the architectures because you know, what the header file does is it will figure out what architecture it is in and then it would use the proper underlying type to specify the width. So sometimes it will say long, long, sometimes it will say you know, just long and so on and so forth, or short in some cases. Yeah, so the header file would predetermine, you know, what, how to declare an integer of a specific width. So all you have to do in that case is you just have to use your know, in uh, like 32 underscore t. So these are the these are the type depth that are, that are provided by the header file. So in this case, you know, um, if you use u int 16 underscore t, it is always going to refer to a 16 bit wide unsigned integer. So you don't have to worry about, okay, is it 32 bit or is it 8 bit wide or is it 16 bit wide? You know, by using these type depths, you, know, you will always be guaranteed about the width of the integer type. Yep. <clears throat> so in that case, it is um, most compilers allow you to use the long, the word long, to specify wider integer types. So if int is only 16 bit wide, um, long int may refer to 32 bit wide, and then long, long int may refer to 64 bit wide. But I don't believe there's an actual ANSI standard to specify which one is which one. So you know, uh, that's why this particular header file is compiler specific, it's also architecture specific. But you leave it up to the compiler people and the people who work with the architecture, work with the, 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 um, uh, the, um, the back end of the compiler to figure all this out. All you have to do is to pound include the header file and use the proper type def and you, you'll be fine. Yep. Oh, that's be, that is why K0 is an input pin. Because you basically, you chain two 16-bit adders or you chain two 16-bit addition operations where the output of the least significant addition becomes K0 of the more significant adder or addition operation. That is why, huh? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you need registers, memory, and the whole nine yard. But, but that's why we have K0 as an input because it may be, a a link in the chain of multiple additions to get addition working for a wider integer type. Yep. Very good questions. I like those discussions. All right. Let me take a look at the time. So before we switch gear to talk about comparison, <clears throat> I'm going to take role. So we're going to take a look at the role taking activity today, which is invisible to you right now until now.
There we go. So now we can take a look at the access code. And it is complement. Complement. It's not complement. So that doesn't work. Okay, C O M P L E M E N T. All right. Well, hmm. I'm wondering what I want to show you. Let's do this. Okay, let's let's look at this up first. Okay, stash it here. All right. So I'm switching gear to talk about something that is not really related to this class, okay? But it's going to be related to you nonetheless, okay? It's about things that I have kind of toyed around in OpenAI in ChatGPT. How many people have kind of experimented with ChatGPT? Okay, we got about, I would say about you know, half the class you know, raised their hand. <clears throat> so I want to show you what I did with you know, ChatGPT because I know most of you know what kind of question you can ask, but um, career path suggestion, uh, probably not too related to this class, but that's okay. Uh, I'll start with this one. So this is a conversation that I had with uh, ChatGPT on concepts in CISP 440. So I asked the question of, I'm studying the concepts of you know, functions, injections, surjections, and bijections. Can you generate some questions that can help me confirm my understanding of these concepts? So ChatGPT just you know, kind of generated a bunch of questions, but it's hard to know whether I got the right answer right or not. So later on, I asked you something else. Can you give me examples of some functions as sets of two tuples and ask me whether each is injective, surjective, or bijective? So this time, you know, it gave me five examples that have definite answers. And then later on, you know, um, take your time to analyze each function. But if I were to con continue this conversation and ask ChatGPT to give me the answers of each one of these questions that ChatGPT generated, it would have given me the answer, the answers with full explanations. Okay, so why is this important to you? Not to this class, but it, why, why is this important to you as a student in general? Yes, you now have a 24 seven, you, you now have 24 seven access to a private tutor. You can wake up 2 a.m. in the morning and go like, okay, this concept has been bugging me. You know, I need you know, some illustrations, examples of what does it mean to be blah. Turn on your computer. Okay, I know most of you do not even bother to turn off your computers. So just you hop, just get up, you know, get to your computer, type that up, or do you put it on your phone and have G, you know, chat GPT to give you some additional instructions or you know, clarifications. Yes. <clears throat> Say again? Yes. So every hyperlink is a is basically a link to a to a conversation. Okay. Oh. Okay. Like you would have to like uh, summarize the uh, World War II. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would start with like a summary. Like each sentence would be like where about that song, like history.com. You can see it'll be like different, like bibliography. Oh, okay. I did not know that. Okay, that's cool to know. <clears throat> so the other thing is you can actually use a LaTeX. This is good for your math classes, okay? So let's say you're taking a calculus class and there's a particular integration that you're having problem with. You're not quite understanding how to perform, you know, how to get the closed form of the integration. You can use LaTeX inside the backslash open paren and the backslash close paren 
and then put the LaTeX representation inside, and ChatGPT actually understands math formulae, which to me is a little bit scary, <laughs> but it does, okay? It actually understands your know, math equations, so you can actually ask you know, ChatGPT to, I mean, this is a really simple one, right? I just ask you know, ChatGPT to do the simplification for me. But not only does it give me the answer, it also showed me the reasoning, okay? All the steps in between. So from that perspective, chat GPT can be used in a very constructive way from your perspective, okay? When you have a concept you're not quite understanding because text notes are too terse, okay? You know, you know, it's, not, you know, it's not complete enough, okay? You can actually ask chat GPT for clarifications, for examples for practice you know, exercises, okay? So this is a, I think this is a huge resource, okay? Yep. Yes, it can be very confident. It always sounds confident. <clears throat> um, yeah, I think uh, some people have tried to use a conversation to gaslight chat GPT to give, to believe in the wrong answer. So I thought that was pretty interesting. You know, you can gas like, you know, chat GPT. Now, I also did some other experiments, okay? These are, you know, not so positive ways to use chat GPT. So look at this particular example here. <laughs> Write a program in C++ that takes a Roman number and return its equivalent in our current numerical system, blah, 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 okay? I just did a Google search on uh, programming methodology one, which is you know, what we know as CISP 360, uh, as a homework assignment. This is, this is the description of a homework assignment. I copied the description verbatim <laughs> into chat GPT. <clears throat> and chat GPT goes like, oh, okay. I can certainly help you with that. And not only that, there's a little link here called copy code. <laughs> okay, so you go like, okay, so you know, me being a professor, look at this and go like, okay, I gotta ask questions in a, in a different way. Okay, so let's, let's try a different way of asking questions, potentially in a quiz. So now I go like, okay, let's try this one. Okay, this is another link, which is also interesting. Oops. So with this one, you know, I made this particular function, you know, and I do not bother to give it a meaningful name. It's just function f, right? And it's, it's recursive, okay? You can see how f is calling itself, okay? It is very terse, no comments whatsoever, you know, and it's, I mean, if you can read this and know right away what it does, you are really way superior to, you know, most people, you, you're, you're, you're doing better than I expected, okay? Um, this is string length in, in a very recursive and cryptic way because not only did I use you know, recursion, I also do not use the if then else statement and instead I use a ternary expression to make it as terse and as cryptic as possible. Now, I ask ChatGPT, can you describe what the following C function does? ChatGPT comes back, with a full explanation, and it was actually correct. So after this, I go like, hmm, I need to make my questions even more tricky so that your chat GPT cannot answer that question. So this is my third attempt of making a question to trick chat GPT and say that, okay, maybe you cannot answer this question. So. Now I say, the following code is supposed to find the length of a string in C. What is wrong with it? Yes? Uh, I can I can copy and paste it as in plain text into a text editor and clean it up first. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Okay, I, I get that, you know, but but there are easy ways to get around it too, you know. But in this case, <coughs> ChatGPT was able to identify, I forgot to initialize the counter to zero. It actually read the code and understood that, oh, if you don't initialize you know, the counter first, it's going to have an uninitialized value and it explains it. <laughs> so I think in from your perspective, this should be a little bit startling, a little scary. Why do you think that is the case? Yeah. So you have to you have to outdo chat GPT in order to get hired. So, right, okay, let's roll back a little bit. <clears throat> there has been some layback, uh, layoff you know, in the high tech companies. You know, I, I think some of you might have heard about it. You can Google search, okay? You can Google search all, the, all of this. So now we have a, a certain pool of people who got laid off by Google, by Amazon, by Facebook, you know, and so on. And they're floating around looking for jobs. And in about two years of time, two or three years of time, you will be graduating with your bachelor's degree and you'll be looking for a job too. So now we have a, a fairly good size of pool of people looking for jobs. And now we also have chat GTP being able to do this. Now this is what it can do today. Moore's law says you know, in two years, it will be at least quote unquote twice as capable. That is your competition. So you kind of have to think about what you need to do to prepare for that day when you graduate with a bachelor's degree in computer science. And don't ask me, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I don't have the answer because your things are changing rapidly, okay? So you have to keep an eye on these things. You know, keep experimenting with you know, chat GPT and all the AI engines. And at the same time, think about you know, what you can do to outdo your know, chat GPT. How would you convince an employer to hire you? <laughs> uh, that mean that I think that boat has sailed. That train has left the station. Yep, because the more people use it, the more it learns, and then the better it becomes. <laughs> which is which is kind of ironic in a in a really really interesting sense. All right, so I do want to show you this, you know, because I found these things, you know, um, just this morning. I was experimenting a lot, you know, because I had a, I have to do a workshop with some of the other faculty members about, you know, how to use AI, particularly in STEM classes, in a constructive way. Um, and I really feel sorry for people who uh, think, you know, oh, I can use, you know, Chat GPT to do, to do my homework. This is great. I'm taking an online class. Everything is online, and I'll just use Chat GPT to do everything for myself. What's wrong? Why do you think I'm concerned for those people? Sorry, they're not learning anything except you know how to get to you know Chat GPT and just copy and paste the question. Yep. It's a great, you know, uh, useful tool. It's a very useful tool for learning because, you know, if you encounter some you know, difficulties in class, I'm not explaining something well enough, you know the terms to look for, like what is two's complement? What is the two's complement of the bit pattern representing blah, blah, blah in, you know, X many bits? Do you want me to try that? I'm not kidding. Do you want me to try that? Let's do that. Okay. Because... I think it's a really useful tool, and knowing how to use the tool in a constructive way is important. Uh, so we are going to chat.openai.com, and I'm signed in already. Okay, so let's let's ask uh, Chat and GPT to say, derive, oops, the derive <coughs> the twos twos complement of a six bit pattern representing 
Okay, two complement of uh, so with six bits, you know, we can represent up to uh, it would be negative from negative thirty-two to positive thirty-one. So you guys pick a number. Seven. Okay, we'll use seven. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we'll see what what ha what's going to happen here. Yep, it, it's right. But it shows you the steps, okay? It shows you every single step along the way. So the question is, if you ask G Chat and GPT these questions, it's giving you the answer. Are you learning from it? Okay. So let me let me pick something here that I may not be uh, understanding 100%. Uh, okay. Explain what. Explain how to invert bits, okay? Explain how to invert bits. Okay, let's see what it comes back with, okay? Invert the first bit, okay, so it shows you examples. I did not even ask for an example, but it shows the example. So I think this is a really good, you know, ex you know this is a good um, example to illustrate you know, what you can do with your know, chat GPT. <clears throat> Later on in this class, we'll actually start to program in assembly language, and I am sorry, chat GPT won't be able to help you there because I have my own architecture. <laughs> so I'm not using the Intel architecture. There's, there, is not, there are not enough literature online to train chat GPT to answer questions that are specific to my architecture. So at that point, you know, it's not going to be as useful, but right now, hey, you know, all the concepts that we have talked about up to this point, it understands. Yep. Um, sorry? Because uh, the instruction set of Intel's architecture is overly complicated from the perspective of learning how the computer architecture links to the instruction set. So the way I do it is to have a fairly simplistic architecture, and then you can actually see, oh, so this instruction is going to exercise these things in this particular way to get the job done. The Intel you know, art, uh, instruction set is too complicated for me to actually give you a larger SIM version of the processor so they can actually see how everything happens. But the processor that I invented just for this class is simplistic enough that they all fit into almost one single page in larger SIM. So this way, you know, if you want to understand, so how does it load this thing from memory into this register? You can just pause, you can stop the clocking, then you can actually see the path between the components. And then you can single clock it so that you can, you can actually see how the content gets into a particular register. When, I mean, you, you know, obviously it, it doesn't have any meaning right now, but by the time we get there, it gives you the kind of X-ray view, view of inside the processor. So you can actually um, relate what is inside the processor with the instruction itself, which is something you cannot do with the x86 architecture. It's just too complex for that. Um, you, there was a question back there. Do you uh, still? The, the short answer is because I can. The longer answer is because it makes sense. <laughs> yes. Hmm? Um, a processor and a CPU are the same thing. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit, which is not how most people refer to those things now, because we, we have multiple cores in the same processor, so it doesn't really kind of make sense to call it the Central Processor Unit, because there are multiple units inside the CPU. No, 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 I designed it already. You guys just have to use it. <laughs> if you're transferring to Berkeley, you know, that would be your final senior year project is to enhance a processor that is already designed, but you have to add features to it. So kind of fun classes. All right. Okay, we got five minutes left, okay? 
So with five minutes left, I am going to shift gear a little bit and show you the necessity of the next module you know, of what we're going to be talking about. Okay. <clears throat> Come on, it's not working. Well, that part is working, but it won't advance to the next page. There we go, all right. All right, so what we want to do is to do subtraction right now, okay? Right. Just switch to something else, there we go. All right. So what we want to do is to do subtraction, okay? So we are going to do a, a easy one, okay? Everybody know this subtraction, you know, the result of the subtraction without even have to think about it twice. Four bits, we have one, one, zero, zero, minus zero, 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 like that. What is the answer? One, one, zero, zero, okay. All right. So from this subtraction, uh, we have no overall carry, so I forgot one extra zero here. There we go. <clears throat> so if I change the question a little bit, which is, um, is 1100 zero, zero less than 0000, zero, 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 what would be the answer to that question? Hmm? It depends, right? So now we have a little concern here because 1100, zero, zero, according to that picture, the circle that we had earlier, it can be representing negative four. It can also be representing 12, right? Um, if you compare negative four and zero, okay? And the only concern of us is whether it's less than or not. This is true, negative four is less than zero. 12 is less than zero, it's false. So this, is the only time when it matters. When you're trying to compare two bit patterns to figure out whether the first is less than the second one, then you really have to think about, um, are we dealing with signed or unsigned here? Because unsigned, 12 is less than zero, would, have tell, it would, would, be, zero, would be false. <clears throat> In signed representation, negative four is less than zero is supposed to be true. But the subtraction operation is the same. So the foundation of comparison is a subtraction. We look at the result of a subtraction to determine whether the first number, which is x, is less than the second number, which is y. So now when you look at this math here, you go like, um, so how do we make that determination, okay? That is going to be the focus of, ne of the next lecture on next Tuesday. Which means, okay, because somebody asked me you know, what we should be reading. So I'm going to give you guys you know, exactly what you need to read in order to be prepared for next Tuesday's lecture. It is um, down here. Subtraction and, oh, no, 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 I take it back. It is a link right here, binary comparison, okay? So read binary comparison, which has references back to you know, binary subtraction. It has references back to signed versus unsigned representation, because all of those are important concepts to understand what is binary comparison. Today's lab is two's complement, okay? So you still need that <clears throat> access key, so don't go yet. The access key for today's lab is negative, okay? So all lowercase negative is the access code of tonight's lab. I'll see you guys over at the lab.